This week there was a, a chap on uh, a Twitter, kind of on Twitter, kind of a friend of a friend on Twitter, and uh, he he said something quite telling and quite typical of our time. He, he was responding to the beheading of a British aid worker in the desert with some pretty strong, um, let's say, anti-religious sentiments. That was the way he was expressing himself. Uh, I'm a scientist, so I'm not religious, but these people, they're doing all this because of religion, you know? And I, I just... Uh, I felt these comments were not very revealing, really, about the situation, more about him and the state of our times, because whatever motivates people beheading British and American aid workers who are out there helping Muslims, whatever motivates those people certainly ain't theology, is it? It ain't their theology. But religion is getting blamed for all this stuff that seems so bad as to be... Well, God would want nothing to do with, with it. He might say, oh, it's nothing to do with me. So religion, yes or no? See, ever since I read this book uh, by a guy called Fritz Ridnauer, it was called How to Be a Christian Without Being Religious, and it was, it was kind of on the subject of the Book of Romans, uh, and it was a very, very long time ago. Ever since I read that, I've been very clear on this issue. Modern discussions of religion in, in the Christian world, though, and the spirituality movement of the last 10 years, they've muddied the waters a bit. I've been clear saying religion is what not we're about, but then there's been this later muddying of the waters. Spirituality, that word spirituality is an alternative to religion. That word has been appropriated by Buddhism, and they're talking about mindfulness and all that. It's being appropriated by um, uh, New Ageism. They talk about being spiritual but not religious. And now, as if that helps, the more right-wing theologians on American blogging sites have come out in defense of using the word religion. I belong to the Christian religion. It's a religion. Yeah, wait a minute. The way they've done that is, is they've looked at James and what James says using the word that's translated for us as religion in James 1, 26 and 7. If someone thinks he's religious yet does not bridle his tongue and so deceives his heart, his religion is futile, it says, futile, empty. It's an empty shell. Pure and undefiled religion before God the Father is this, to care for orphans and widows in their misfortune and to keep oneself unstained by the world. So what they say is, there we are, God wants us to have religion. Stop right there. Who is the book of James written to? Bear in mind James's audience. James's audience are people who are very, very wedded to their religion. He's writing for predominantly religious Jewish people, scattered, we believe, after the outbreak of persecution against Jews in, in, in Rome, Jerusalem, and so on. Religious Jews. He's trying to turn them from empty religion. They've got religion. Getting them off religion is going to be hard work. What he's trying to do is he's trying to say, look, okay, let's just, just granted the word religion because you've got it. Let's make sure it really is true religion if you're going to have it. That's a different thing from saying you ought to be religious, isn't it? Do you see the point? And he's saying, well, if you're going to have religion, this is what it's got to look like. It's got to reflect the grace of God. Because it's by grace you are saved through faith. That not of yourselves, it is the gift of God. We are God's workmanship created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which he's prepared for us beforehand to walk in. The fruit of faith is what? The good works that are being associated here with pure and undefiled religion. The gospel gives rise to this. It's not that religion gives rise to this. Do you see the point? Yeah. So... James is almost using the word religion by permission rather than positive recommendation. And he's saying, if you're going to talk about religion, let's be absolutely clear, it doesn't mean what most people seem to mean by it. We've got to make it mean something different. We've got to make it mean this. Should we use that word of our, our, ourselves? Should we allow ourselves to be described as religious? Well, given the view that's taken of religion in our society... Using the word to describe living Christian faith is probably highly unwise in our cultural context. And we've got a clear example where things stand on this in Mark chapter 7, verses 1 to 23. And that's our passage today. 
Jesus' teaching throughout this incident is around the issue of ritual. As if that's all there is. Ritual uncleanness in particular. And the objection that kicks this all off is, is about that. And the point that will conclude the incident is all about that. Ritual uncleanness. Okay, ritual uncleanness. It's not until chapter 7 verses 14 to 23 Jesus gets to address that issue directly. What Jesus does in 1 to 13 is to explain to these religious leaders who've turned up and are being so critical of him that the stance they are taking on this issue is actually just the symptom of a far deeper problem. The things that people come at you with when, you, when they're talking God, religion, Christianity are very often simply the symptoms of a far deeper problem. And Jesus only unfolds that problem in the second part of the passage. And that's where the point gets made. So we need to bear that in mind when we're dealing with people too. The thing somebody comes at you with is probably a symptom of a far deeper problem. So Jesus gives us his example. He is training disciples. In verses 1 to 13, Jesus explains to these religious leaders who have been so critical, there's more to it. But what he's doing while we're being told this is the description of how the disciples are being trained to go out into the world and be fishers of men because they've repented of sin and trusted in Jesus and followed him to express that repentance and faith. This is how then to deal with the critical rules-bound religious people and the purpose of Mark here is to show the disciples, show Christ's subsequent disciples, how to deal with critical religious people. And Jesus is at his most die. Wrecked. We need to keep this in mind. This is a worked model for disciples on how to handle legalistic, rule-inventing hypocrites whose actions actually marginalise the role of the scriptures. Their actions marginalise the role of the word of God. We're going to get to that shortly. I've given you too much of a summary early on, potentially. So what happens? Here's the story. Now the Pharisees and some of the experts in the law who came from Jerusalem gathered round him. Now I don't want you to imagine this is, you know, like a bunch of people gathering round somebody in a marketplace and giving him a an ear beating, threatening, you know, standing around, right, having a go at him. Um, when these guys turned up, they would gather around a teacher, they'd gather around somebody who was teaching the law, a rabbi or whatever, and in gathering around, that's how you came to learn and you watched and you observed. So that's what's going on. They gathered around Jesus, these big guys, experts in the law, leading Pharisees, they've come down from Jerusalem. Here come the London preachers, okay? As if that's any better. And they saw that some of Jesus' disciples ate their bread with unclean hands. That is unwashed. Here's what they observed. They're eating, the disciples are eating with unwashed hands. And that's a reflection on this rabbi. I mean, how can that happen? Now here's a word of explanation for the Roman Christians that Mark is writing to. For the Pharisees and all the Jews don't eat unless they perform a ritual washing. Got that? It's not about washing your hands before dinner. It's not about not coming in off the yard and helping yourself to the biscuit tin. Okay? It's not that. Yeah, we don't. I'm sure none of us do that. How outrageous. What a terrible thing that would be. Um, okay? He's saying the ritual washing. That's the point. It's a religious thing. And when they come from the marketplace, they do not eat unless they wash. They hold fast to many other traditions. This is a habit with them. The washing of cups and pots and kettles and dining couches. Right? And the Pharisees and the experts in the law asked him, why do your disciples not live, here's, here's their beef, why do your disciples not live according to the tradition of the elders, but eat with unwashed hands? There's the point. That's the issue. The Pharisees come down and gather round. That's the context of the encounter. They saw that Jesus' disciples were eating their bread with unclean hands, unwashed, that is ceremonially unclean. And the Pharisees said, why do your disciples not live according to the tradition of the elders? Why do your people, why does your son, why does your wife, why don't they come to church in a suit with a tie and a hat on, ladies? You know, hats and skirts. Okay, you can sort the genders out. You get the picture. Why is that? It's a reflection on you and your ministry. It's a reflection on your church. You are not walking with God tradition as a kind of a shibboleth as a, are you one of us are you the proper now, if anybody wants to wear a hat to church ladies it's fine guys actually I don't 
care because that's not what that verse means. If you want to wear a hat in church, fine, bring your beanie. Okay, fine, not an issue, not an issue. Because that's not what that verse of scripture is saying. I'll, I'll, I'll argue that with somebody contentiously in another, another time. But, but there's the point. If you want to wear a hat, wear a hat. If you, oh, somebody did. Um, if you, you know, but for, 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 okay, leave it there. Here's the point. You're not, your disciples are not keeping to the tradition of the elders, the people who've gone before. And I'm a million miles from my notes and I don't know how far I've got. Okay, so they turn up. Verse 1. They come and they see something and they say, Aha! Gotcha! Gotcha! Now there's the explanation for us. Their objection is based on the tradition of the elders. It's not about hygiene. It's about hubris. And that's a different thing altogether. They get this not from the Bible, of course. They get this from extending the Bible's teaching by adding their human traditions to the inspired body of faith and practice that God has seen fit to entrust to them. And Jesus says, I am not having that. He opposes it loudly, violently and sarcastically. That's interesting, isn't it? Anyone think of a modern example that ought to be opposed in that way? We've had the explanation. Hands, faces, cups, pots, kettles, dining couches. I think things went on in Greek dining society that were not nice and not hygienic. And that's probably where the couches thing comes in. But I've certainly come across my own experience having Orthodox Jewish friends who come around for a cup of coffee, perhaps at university or whatever. And they'll, they'll come and they'll sit with you as a Gentile, but you are really unclean. And uh, well, my room often was as a student, I'm afraid. And uh, they might consider, when they really get to know you, they might consider having a coffee with you, but would it be okay if they washed the kettle first? Because obviously a Gentile's kettle is polluted, yeah? So they need to wash it out. So this, this is not a, it's not a, it's an old thing, but it's not gone, you know? This happens. You're not quite acceptable. <clears throat> so, you can see, there's going to be a direct challenge. And the official objection gets critiqued by Jesus. The fact that you're being objected to for some reason doesn't mean the objection is wrong. And Jesus says, let us bring your objection to me to the light. He said to them, verse 6, Isaiah prophesied correctly about you hypocrites as it is written. Now, can you imagine the scene? Isn't that gorgeous? There are these highly qualified, well-respected, learned people who've turned up in their flowing robes, and they're wealthy too, because they have to be to be where they are in life. And they turn up, and Jesus says to them, in response to their legal criticism, in a, in a pattern that you know, is, is accepted in their way of doing things, he says, Isaiah prophesied about you hypocrites as it is written. So he's going to these guys who are the experts in the law and he's saying, as it is written. What he's doing is he's quoting their Bible straight in their face. You're supposed to believe this. And he's not going to marginal matters. He's going to central issues. Their own rule book has overtaken and superseded scripture. And their own rule book does not bind the individual conscience in this way. And Jesus' in integrity as a leader, as a teacher, as a spiritual man, is coming under direct and quite hostile challenge, and you'll find that sometimes. And that challenge is intended to discredit Jesus and his, his teaching of truth and his ministry. It isn't a criticism that's intended to restore, and there's a world of difference between those two things, isn't there? A criticism that comes from somebody who cares and loves you and wants to restore the situation and somebody who comes because they're trying to knock you down. He's, they're coming to discredit. The intention of the challenge is to destroy. You do not take Jesus on like that without discovering that he's a serious sort of person. Now we do sometimes need to be serious sorts of persons with people. These religious people when they come along in this way. If their objection is upheld, the gospel's finished. And Jesus has no object, no hesitation in knocking them down straight away. 
People's eternal destinies are at stake. You challenge Jesus, seeking to discredit him, and you will find very quickly that Jesus is no purring pussycat. Get ready for the lion to roar. This people honour me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. Their worship, which they care about so much, they're banging all this temporary worship -y whatever, and their, their daily stuff they do. Pointless. Empty. Vain. Because they teach as doctrine, as that which is to be believed from God, the commandments of men. Now we see that happening in all sorts of forums today. We see it in the extreme theological right. We see it in the extreme theological left. We see it in the extreme cessationist movement. We see it in the extreme charismatic movement. And in our most self-critical moments, we can see the roots of that, the seeds of that in ourselves. And we need to, we need to stamp on those seeds. We, we, we need to get rid of them. Now the effect of all this that Isaiah says, Jesus says, is having no regard for the commandment of God, you hold fast to human tradition. What matters most to you is your tradition. And you've let go of the word of God here somewhere. You guys who are supposed to be there, all full on Bible guys, you've clung so tight to your tradition that you've lost the word of God. What a searching, what a searching thing to say to these religious guys. Never mind your man-made religion. Jesus comes at them with the actual law and the actual prophets. He fights back the tradition-bound religious with the Bible. And he does it with plain and non-peripheral passages. Law and prophets. You know, they had three divisions of their Bible. In the, the Jewish guys, these Jewish guys. Law prophets and writings but they made more of the law and the prophets and Jesus comes at them with the law and the prophets because having done the prophets and having said here's the issue with you verse 8 no regard for the command of God holding fast to human tradition he then goes to Moses and he says oh and sarcasm you I cannot tell you how plain the sarcasm is in verse 9 you got a fine way of rejecting the commandment of God in order to establish your tradition oh well done it's utterly sarcastic you are hypocrites. God has got the measure of you, warned you, warned about you. Here's where your religion breaks down, when your hearts get out of sync with your lips. And when human rules replace God's word. And here's where that leads. Verse 8, having no regard for the command of God, you hold fast to human tradition. And I've had people, I've had elders in churches, good long established churches with a long tradition of evangelicalism and so on, reformed theology. I've had people say to me, ah, oh, but some traditions are good. <laughs> yeah. I'm tempted to say, yeah, and you learn the most about them in the Bible. I had a prof yesterday on interpreting according to the context. How do you interpret a text? You, 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 how do you know you've got the meaning of it? Well, you look at the context, that's very important, yeah? You look at the broader spread of the Bible's redemptive purpose, and you look at the way the church has understood this verse over the centuries. And I'm left thinking, that's human tradition. And I want to say, we interpret a text in the view of the text itself, in view of the co-text, that is what lies around it, and the context of the time, not the way the church has interpreted it over the years because that's getting us back into human tradition it's a problem that's about in our reformed circles in our evangelical circles wherever it is we fit it's a problem that's alive and well and we need to be aware of it that guy who said that about the church over this was from reformed theological seminary in the states can you believe it i couldn't my jaw dropped where are we we should be with moses <laughs> there we are okay we're with moses he also said to them, verse 9, 
you neatly reject the commandment of God in order to set up your tradition. That's the sarcastic phrase. The sarcasm has been edited out a little bit in that translation. For Moses said, honour your father and your mother, and whoever insults his father or mother must be put to death. But you say, if anyone tells his father or mother whatever help you had ever received from me is korban. They've got, a, they've got jargon for it. That's, it's always all right if there's jargon for it. Sounds good. That is a gift for God. Then you no longer permit him to do anything for his father or mother. Jesus now takes them to the actual law. They who say they honour Moses, their tradition is established by the rejection of Moses' actual teaching. And this is where emphasis on tradition leads. It leads to rejecting what God has said. Inevitably does. We come to scripture with things in our hearts that aren't repented of, aren't dealt with, aren't cleaned up as we come. And we therefore come biased. And we read it on our grid. And reading it on our grid, we can put curves into the grid. And we swerve away from the bits that, that God is saying we don't like the sound of because they don't suit us. But our religious tradition then baptises that. And Jesus gives them an example from the family. Now that's hilarious. That is hilarious. These are good Jewish guys. They, they bang into sort of families, everything. You know, um, what does Paul say about himself? I was... Um, a Pharisee of the Pharisees of the tribe of Benjamin, blah, 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 blah. It matters to them, their family, you know. Their whole religious system is built on their origins in that family, which is a, one of the chosen. They're Jewish leaders. They were supposed to be big on the family. He says, look what you're doing. Utterly sarcastic. You have a fine way of rejecting the command of God to establish your tradition. And look, at the heart of the matter, you're messing this up. In the family which you're supposed to be hot on. You know, Jesus, intolerance, Christianity, Christians are intolerant. Jesus definitely veers towards intolerance rather than sin tolerance. Doesn't he? Have you noticed that? Does that figure with you? No, we don't want to be nasty, intolerant people. What's Jesus doing here? He's up against the religious. And to deal with that context, he's intolerant rather than sin tolerant. Not afraid to meet the serious challenge to his ministry's credibility from these religious leaders. And he's confronting them with biblical evidence challenges to their conduct. The way it works in the way they behave. And that's scary and it's searching. And here's how he sums it up in verse 13. And, you know, he is hitting them with a hammer here metaphorically. Thus you nullify the word of God by your tradition that you have handed down. And you do many things like this. Church history is important. It's important to read the Puritans. But, you know, just, just a second, they didn't get it all right. Jonathan Edwards, great, fantastic, but he didn't get it all right. Thomas Watson, great, fantastic, we were talking yesterday, but Richard Baxter, yeah, but Richard Baxter did not get it all right. When the tradition assumes the position of the word of God, we get into terrible deep water. And Jesus just smashes it to those religious people. You nullify the word of God by your tradition. That is a, that would be taken amiss that you have handed down. This is not in divine origin. And that's not all. You do loads of this stuff all the time. Why is he so clear? Why is he confronting these guys head on? Jesus does that with those who claim to be religious leaders but are blind guides. And why did he do that? It's because they are leading others, innocent followers, into the pit. You shall know the truth, says Jesus, and the truth shall set you free. Implication, you're not free already. You need the truth to set you free. They are leaders. And truth matters because error has consequences as to where you're going, where you're being led. And because that's true, 
Jesus now turns to the crowd. He's finished with them. That's all you're getting from me. He turns now to the crowd who are being led by this lot because they need to be led straight, not into the pit. Yeah? Jesus now turns verses 14 and 15 to the crowd and he's very brief. Verse 14, then he called the crowd again and he said to them, listen to me everyone and understand. Get this. And he tells them something. It's going to stick in their heads. I'll give you an illustration. There is nothing outside of a person that can defile him by going into him. Rather, it's what comes out of a person that defiles him. Who was here last week? Not, not so many last week. Um, Caleb was here last week. And Caleb had on the laptop, and Helen and you two, there was an illustration, wasn't there? Have you remembered it? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, of Psalm 51. Do you remember the illustration? He brought a bag on, didn't he? Oh, yes, yes. See, so thanks, Jim. Um, <laughs> because I was going to say to you, nobody's going to have forgotten that. <laughs> Jim has. <laughs> Jesus says something really very basic. At best, very basic. He's lodging something in the minds of those people that they will go away and think about. Caleb has been thinking about that all week, I will guarantee you. I wanted to bring some today. Yeah, you know. Hmm. Do you see the point? Jesus is saying there's nothing outside of a person that can defile him by going into him. It's what comes out of a person that defiles him. That's the principle that he wants to establish. And there's the worldview challenging principle, clear and simple, a little epithet that will keep the ordinary people, if they just think about it, from the dangers posed by the religiosities that are their teachers. These both are just windbag religiosities. It's simple, it's memorable, it's slightly crude. So much so that the disciples think they must have misunderstood. They need more, they need more information. They, they don't quite get this. Jesus surely couldn't have been saying something like that, could he? So Jesus teaches his disciples about it, verses 16 to 23, and he does lay it on with a bit of a shovel, if you'll pardon the expression in the current context. I hadn't thought of that. Move on quickly. Jesus teaches them about it because they think he can't possibly be saying that. Yes, he is. Jesus had left the crowd end of the house. His disciples asked him about the parable. Lord, Lord, what? What was that? That sort of, uh, okay, the Greek word that's used there for parable, it's not a parable like a big story. It's an illustration. It's the Hebrew, I suspect the Aramaic would have been the word mashal, okay, which can be an illustration or a story. Jesus had left the crowd, entered the house. His disciples asked him about the parable. He turns on them now. He's not having a good day. He turns to them. He says, are you so foolish? Are you so foolish? No, no I, I tend not to do that in a sermon. I'm sure you're pleased. It's not the way you want to spend a Sunday morning being asked if you're so foolish, is it? Um, but Jesus is saying, get your heads around this. What's the matter? Don't you understand? Whatever goes into a person from outside cannot defile him. It does not enter his heart, but his stomach goes out into the sewer. Do I need to spell this out for you boys? Now we're all just boys together? And then Peter, through Mark, puts that bit in brackets. That means all foods are clean. Remember, we, the Roman church context, we, we've got Jews and Gentiles and all sorts of people all together in that church context. All foods are clean, boys. Don't forget the Council of Jerusalem. Don't forget Acts 15. Yeah? We're looking after one another. We're trying to take care of one another. We're not trying to offend one another. We're trying to be the church of God together. But bear this in mind. All foods are clean. Wow. There's a bit of a scary one. He said, whatever comes out of a person defiles him. For from within, out of the human heart, come evil ideas, sexual immorality, theft, murder, adultery, greed, evil, deceit, debauchery, envy, slander, pride and folly. Are you so foolish? Where's this coming from, guys? Is it that your hearts are not prepared to believe what I'm saying to you because you've got some agenda? You feel comfortable with your religion? You don't want to have to stand out from the crowd? What's your agenda? All these evils come from within, and these are what def defile a person. Now he's teaching the disciples this. He's making it plain to them. And they're on this training course to be fishers of men. They need this in their psychology to be those who have repented of sin because the kingdom of God has arrived, to have turned from sin and trusted Jesus, and as a result of that, to have followed him. And when they're following him, being turned into fishers of men. You need to know this. You've got to get this really through your head. This inward defilement, stuff, what comes out from inside you is what defiles you. That's, that's an essential part of our gospel. 
We're not teaching this religious system. We're saying we're dealing with the heart and with sin. He teaches the disciples because they need to know the truth because the truth is what's going to set people free. And then he teaches this principle. He teaches it negatively. He teaches the principle. It's, it's not what goes into you that defiles. He teaches that negatively. And, and he's going to teach it positively. And he, he reasons for that from things that they can understand. And again, there's an example there to us of how we have to deal with people. Reasoning from what is known to what they haven't quite grasped yet. Reasoning from the material and the observable to the spiritual and the eternal. Yeah? Spend ages on that, but I'm not going to because you don't want me to. All foods are clean, says Mark. All these evils come from within and defile a person. We live in a world that's got people in it who feel not good enough, who feel, well, actually, we, we deal with people all the time who feel that there's been things in their background, their life, their times, that they're guilty of still, and they feel defiled by. And we're to live amongst them as people who, who are liberated from that, because there are things in our past and in our background, and, and the gospel of God's grace is applied to that. And it's enough. We trust Jesus that it's enough. That's what we trust Jesus with, isn't it? We turn from our sin and we trust him that what he's done on the cross is enough to put me right with God. I can live free. Because whatever it is back there that I feel guilty of, I can live free. A few weeks ago, somebody who I had not expected told me some stuff from a long time ago that I did not expect to hear. And you just have to say, believing person, the gospel has set us free from all defilement. All defilement. And there are times when you can live your whole life with something just there that you haven't, you haven't actually cleared up. It's not necessarily you haven't repented of it, you regret it deeply, but the grace of God has not been applied to that. And that's where a lot of this outward religiosity comes from, you know. This outward show of religion is sort of tacked on the outside because the sufficiency of Christ hasn't really been applied to all that garbage back there. Does that make sense to you? We're trying to show we're something we're not because there's something back there we're still feeling guilty about. But Christ has died. His blood has been shed. God is satisfied. But it hasn't been applied to that. And therefore we feel we have to look good. We're not secure in the dying love of Christ. And therefore we need to make ourselves look respectable outwardly. And what we need to be as the people of God, as those he has commissioned to be fishers of men, is the people who've dealt with the garbage, have proclaimed across it for our own benefit and for anybody else's, that the death of Christ on the cross is sufficient for all my sin. And I go free. That's what those disciples need to be in the world. Not trying to cover up for past failures or present failures even by some great show of outward religiosity. But living in the glorious liberty of the sons of God. Does that make sense? So now where do we stand on religion? We want to get the cross and put it straight in the middle of it. And we <laughs> dosh at that. Don't hit it with a hammer, hit it with a cross maybe. Jesus hits it hard. Where do we stand on religion? If you're going to use that word, you need to redefine what, this, what use this world already makes of the word and ensure that your words and example are serving the purpose of your redefinition. Because when you say religion, people think they know what you're talking about and that is not religion pure and undefiled that James speaks of. People will very likely say to you this week, as an old, an old guy was saying in Welsh at the Burger Van yesterday morning as we were going up to Welshpool, the trouble in the world is getting caused by religion. That's sort of religion it is, yeah. Maybe. And that's his excuse for not going to chapel and be sure that man feels very secure with that defence against going to chapel. Because he hasn't perceived the gospel in that chapel. Possibly it isn't there. 
how are we going? How would Jesus want us to challenge that? Because the prevailing culture we're up against in this part of the world is a very, that sort of religious culture. And I suspect that the root of it is that people have not grasped what God has done to deal with sin. They haven't grasped grace. They haven't been surprised by that glorious grace of God in the gospel. How it deals with everything that's back in my past, in my mind, rotting, festering. And if they did, that would be the cure of the religiosity that is killing the thought of proper church in the land of Wales. Guys, we've really got to get hold of that. We've really got to get hold of clearing our testimony that there's sin there, there's terrible stuff back in our hearts, back in our lives, back in our past. But we have been set free by the grace of God because that is the cure of all that Jesus is up against from those guys there on that day and from all the leading on into sin that they are doing by their religiosity. Does that make sense? I hope it helps in some way. And I hope it does in the course of the coming week. May God bless his word to us, equip us better to be living models of the grace of God in the gospel that he's been talking about all the way since, since chapter 1, certainly by verse 14, 15 onwards, that we might be fishers of men in our turn.